And when, the, when I had to sign up for the draft, I said, no way. I, was, I joined up with the Navy right away. So uh, did you go into the service immediately? No. I was allowed to, uh, I joined the V7 program. I was allowed to finish college at my own expense. And then uh, when, when I graduated, they uh, sent me down to Columbia University as a, <clears throat> a midshipman, well, on the midshipman's uh, class. So were you living in Springfield at the time? At the time that I went down to uh, Columbia University, I, I was still in college for a few more days. Now, why did you pick the service branch you joined rather than the Marines or the Air Force or one of the other, or the Coast Guard? Well, I, I knew a little bit about the water. And, uh, and I, had a, I also had an uncle that was in the Navy, and he was regular Navy. And he was still in the Navy as a hospital corpsman. So uh, that, that kind of influenced me a little bit. So what was your first day like in the Navy? Do you remember your first day of service? Well, the first day of service was, if you uh, want to call it active, was uh, going down to uh, Columbia University to this midshipman program. And what kind of things did you learn in that course? Well, we had to uh, learn uh, something about guns and uh, uh, how to uh, pilot a ship around and also to how to navigate through the stars. I forgot all about that now, but uh, we and we didn't do very well on that. <laughs> but anyway, that's basically what we had to do. And, along, and also about uh, in case the ship was hit in any way, how, what do you do for, uh, I can't think of the name, but it was uh, something to do with safety, you know, to uh, try to save as much of the ship as possible by locking all these doors down and so forth. Is I think damage control? Damage control, that's it. You must know a little bit about Navy too, or? Oh, uh, I myself had an uncle in the Navy. Oh. <laughs> but, uh, so, now, uh, what did it feel like to be in the Navy? I mean, what, what were your feelings about being in the service at that time? I had no feelings, uh, you know, we're, we're too dumb to, <laughs> we don't know what we're going to get into, and, uh, and we didn't know where we were going to go. I'm talking about when we went down to, the, uh, to Columbia, we had no idea what we'd do in the Navy at that time. And uh, so did you go through any kind of boot camp, you know, after you, uh, before you got your commission as an officer? Well, when we did, went down to Columbia University, we were apprentice seamen for, uh, one month and after one month we became midshipmen and ev and what we did every most every day uh, was we did, went from uh, uh, classes from nine o'clock in the morning till five o'clock in the afternoon every day <coughs> and every class we had we had a 10 minute exam I said to, boy if I studied like this when I was in college, I would have been an A student because I wanted that commission. <laughs> what would have happened if you failed out of the program? If you failed out of the program, you, you, uh, were, uh, you had two choices. You could go into the Navy as an apprentice seaman or you could go back into the uh, uh, draft. I think that was the way it went. So uh, why were you uh, so determined to avoid being in the Army? I, was, I didn't like the fight, and I felt that if I got into the Army, I'd be good fodder for somebody, <laughs> and I didn't want it to any part of that. So uh, I guess it's a good thing you joined the Navy. We're, we're here today. Yeah. And uh, do you remember your instructors? either uh, down at Columbia or uh, in any of your naval training courses 
that did, does anybody really pop out in your memory? Well, not really, but I do remember some of the officers down there, they were just like us, they were only ensigns. And, but they were really nasty to us. They, they were really giving it to us, you know, made it, they wanted us to be good, solid uh, officers and um, wanted us to not to be friendly, over friendly with the men that we were going to be in charge with. And I thought they were, you know, being uh, cruel to expect us to be inhuman almost to enlisted men but I they were doing their duty and trying to impress to us that we couldn't be palsy with everybody that was going to work be under us <coughs> so how did you get through it uh, what what things did you learn to do to uh, successfully complete the naval training course I guess I I can't say that I learned too much except that <clears throat> I put my time in and and did the best I could on the on the classes because the classes uh, you know were were about fifty minutes at every every hour and uh, as I said ten minutes of every class you had to have an exam of what you had the previous day and. Uh, all I can say is that uh, they were they were pretty comprehensive and and uh, you you had to be on your toes or you you would get flunked out and and a lot of people did flunk out. I think there were around fourteen hundred in our class, and I think by the time that uh, the f four months were over, they had dropped out about three hundred people. I'm guessing at that. I don't know, but I just knew that it was, a dropout was pretty heavy. So, <coughs> after completing that course, uh, where were you deployed? Where did you go? Well, when when we were uh, when we finished uh, Columbia University, everyone was assigned to go someplace. Some people went on cruisers. Some pe people uh, were assigned to uh, submarine, but a good many of us were assigned to uh, amphibious. We know uh, we don't know we didn't know anything about amphibious. Didn't know anything about the ships we would be assigned on. Didn't know anything about the ships until we got there. So, uh, can you describe for uh, the camera uh, what exactly is amphibious warfare? Within the Navy. Well, as far as I know, it's uh, it's too import uh, to uh, uh, to import uh, the army to a beach, and, so <clears throat> and with uh, but also they had battleships there that were bombarding the beach day and night, uh, and. Uh, so that really the Navy, as far as we were concerned, was to get the Army on, on, the, on the beach. And uh, do you recall uh, what kind of ship and craft the, uh, the Navy had built to do this job? What kind of ship, the what? Uh, what kinds of uh, ships and uh, boats and craft did the Navy design to complete this mission? Well, they had uh, LCIs, which were landing craft infantry. <clears throat> uh, they were s smaller ships than an LST. They had LCTs, were landing craft tanks, and we had one, almost, uh, well, all the LSTs had one uh, on their main deck going across the ocean. They were, they were put on waves. Uh, you know, when, they, when a ship was built and put in the ocean, it slides down these ways. Well, they were put on ways on an L LST, and they were anchored down with turnbuckles and probably several chains. 
And <clears throat> when uh, when we got over to England, we uh, would un uh, we would uh, unbuckle them. And then we would ballast the ship so it would tip. I don't know. And so, uh, as it tipped, the greater it tipped, the ship would slide off into the water. And so all, LL all LSTs, to my knowledge, brought a, an LCT over to uh, England. I don't remember taking an LCT over to the Pacific, uh, but I we all and we uh, I think we bought an LCT back from England uh, from uh, we when we came back from the we left Palermo in Italy and uh, we uh, they did. Decommissioned the uh, the Navy base at Palermo, and we took a lot of the personnel and equipment back home. <coughs> Excuse me. And now, uh, what does LST stand for? Landing ship tank, noted basically as low, low slow, slow. Let's see, long slow target. <laughs> so. Uh... <coughs> So what was the size of the ship then? The ship, to my knowledge, was 325 feet long, uh, 28 feet long, and 50 feet wide. And that's bigger, a little bit bigger than a football field. Now, um, what was its maximum speed? Maximum speed was flank speed. Flank speed was about 11 knots. And how much cargo could they carry? Do you, do you recall the specific tonnage? Like, uh, how many tons could they deliver onto a beachhead? I couldn't tell you offhand. I, I do have it in some of the books, but I don't know offhand. And um, if it's a landing ship designed to go on beaches, it must be pretty shallow draft. How much water would you draw? I think that the, the bow was three or four feet, and the, and the stern, when empty, was about uh, uh, seven feet. And then when we were loaded, I think it went to about 14 feet in stern and maybe uh, or maybe seven feet in the bow. I don't know. It wasn't, it wasn't too much. And what kind of armament uh, did the LSTs carry? Well, <clears throat> when we started, we had a, 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 a three inch 50 on the stern and I think we had uh, six, six, uh, 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 20 millimeters on each port and starboard side, and a, a, a twin 40 on the bow. So what was the first time you ever saw an LST? What was your first experience with that ship? Well, the first time that I ever saw an LST was when uh, we were we graduated from uh, mid uh, from uh, Columbia University, and we're shipped down to Solomon's, Maryland, to uh, join the amphibious, and they uh, assigned a a crew and and seven uh, of sixty men and seven officers, and then we. They took us out on an LST on on in Chebe on uh, Chesapeake Bay, <clears throat> and all we did was ob observe uh, for maybe a few days, and then they sent us on our way to pick up a new ship in Pittsburgh. So, how did you feel about the ship? It was okay with me. I don't know. <laughs> and we, we in Chesapeake Bay was was calm and so we never knew what we were going to get in <laughs> on the uh, on the ocean but i did know that a flat bottom boat was not very uh seaworthy but uh 
it proved to be, uh, as far as I was concerned, it proved to be very seaworthy, even though it was uh, kind of hazardous. And, uh, and we did, we saw a lot of storms. And I didn't tell you about the storm coming up at uh, uh, the coast going to New York so, off Cape Hatteras. Okay. When I told you that it was uh, acting like a whip, the main deck did crack, and we already had an LCT on it. And, and of course, it was a bad storm, and the skipper tied a, uh, a line around the, uh, the uh, electrician and set him on outside with all this storm to weld the deck that was cracking. It did a good job because we got to New York without any trouble. So you think he saved the ship? Do I think what? Do you think he saved the ship? No, I don't think he saved it. He, uh, just, he just helped it. <laughs> but anyway, I was really pleased with the ship because I said, boy, if it can take this, and the skipper said it's the worst storm he's ever been in, and he was regular Navy. Uh, uh, so I said, uh, it's not too bad. So how did you deliver the ship from where it was manufactured up to, uh, you say, uh, the convoy sailed out of Boston? So can you describe how you brought it from the steel yard to Boston? From the where? Uh, from, the, the, from the steel yard. How did you oh. bring it from Pittsburgh to Boston? When, uh, when we got aboard our ship in uh, Pittsburgh, uh, we had a pilot. All ships are coming down Ohio River of any size and, and the Mississippi River all, uh, had to have a pilot because they knew the, knew the sandbars and how the depth was in relation to an LST where we would have trouble getting all over these sandbars. And when we, uh, but, but <coughs> As, uh, we really didn't do anything uh, coming down uh, from Pittsburgh to New Orleans. We might have handled, the men might have handled a few lines, but, uh, and maybe the, uh, the motor max or machine that were getting used to the, uh, it, how to, to, to do, uh, run the engines, they probably got more service than any, but any of the rest of the people because they had to learn how to handle the ship both coming to a dock and, and how to handle the motors. Uh, so they probably got more uh, uh, more experience than the rest of the ship men un un uh, until we got out on our own uh, down to New Orleans and practiced beaching. And then when we had to come up the coast. Uh, so can you describe the storm? Uh, did your ship uh, take any damage coming up the east coast? Only the damage I just mentioned that it started to crack. And then uh, something about the, um, the gun tubs. Okay. And the gun tubs, uh, I, I was assigned, my, uh, my general quarter duty was to be a gunnery officer on the 3 inch 50 on the stern. And the 3 inch 50 <coughs> had uh, ready boxes of 3 inch 50 ammunition in them. And when that storm hit us, and we had to plow into it, it would act as a whip. And the ready boxes, all the ready boxes on the stern broke their weld. And we had to tie them down to keep them from, you know, falling off. <laughs> and, uh, but we managed to get to uh, New York without any uh, serious problems other than a cracked deck and, and uh, 
ready ammunition being thrown all over the 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 gun t the gun tub floor. So were you worried about the ammunition detonating? Or? Not really. It had to be uh, armed, and it, and it wasn't armed, so that uh, I wasn't worried about it. And of course, my station wasn't there, only at general quarters, and we weren't at general quarters going up the coast. So, uh, from New York City, uh, where did you go? From New York City, we went to Rhode Island and loaded up. And uh, Would that be Quonset Point? Probably at Quonset Point, a point, because the only time I was ever there, I think that's where it was. I, I know we went into, into Long Island, and we loaded up with. Uh, I can't believe it when I think of it. Loaded up with telephone poles. <laughs> so I said, "Boy, if we got torpedo, we wouldn't sink." <laughs> and then we went up to Boston to form a convoy to go over to. Uh, England. Were you happy to uh, muster out of Boston? Uh, well, I wasn't looking forward to it. We knew what it, we were going to go into Normandy. So what did you do in Boston uh, before you went to England? All we did is have, <coughs> excuse me, in Boston, we were there for a week. And uh, all we had was liberty. And uh, my present wife was working in Boston, and I had asked her to get married a hundred times, but because we were going to war, uh, she said no, but this time she said yes, and we got married in, in Boston on January 26th, 1944. <laughs> and uh, so what was it like going across the ocean from Boston to England? Or did you make any stops in between? We made a stop to Halifax, probably got a few fresh vegetables and, or frozen vegetables because it was cold. And uh, uh, we didn't stay there very long. And I think it was either a 16 or 18 day trip to go all across the Atlantic. And uh, all I know, it was a pretty cold trip. And we had to wear a ski mask because of the spray. Uh, <coughs> whenever we hit foul weather. How long were your deck watches uh, during this trip? Uh, the Navy had deck watches of four hours each, four hours on and four hours off. But they had two dog watches, and uh, uh, of two hours, four to six and six to eight. That was so that you would never stand the same watch every day, and that raised hell with your sleeping. Because you were going all around the clock sooner or later, every single day. And uh, even when you were in port, you had to stand watch four hours off and four hours on, except for those two dog watches. So. Um were there any significant events, any memorable circumstances crossing the Atlantic that you'd like to share in your interview? Well, all I know is that uh, we would have to change course a few times and we could hear the uh, destroyer escorts tell us that uh, there were submarine sightings and so we had to change course back and forth once in a while. but. We never saw any sub. We were fortunate. We never saw any submarines. Were you apprehensive about the possibility of being torpedoed? Like not, not really, because because of the, all the telephone poles that we had, <laughs> <laughs> and we were in the middle of the convoy anyway, so that uh, I it didn't really bother us too much. I don't think. So. Uh, I remember you mentioned before LSTs were equipped with radar for navigation. Yes, if we, if we didn't have them, I don't see how the how the United States would have ever won the war. So uh, you you guys couldn't look at the stars and figure out where you were going to go. All right. Well, <laughs> the skipper did, okay. but we he made us practice it, but we weren't good at it. <laughs> so thankfully, you had radar.
Radar was was a thing. And uh, so, uh, do you recall what month and what year you got to England? Um, it was February uh, 1944, the tail end, or it could have been the 1st or 2nd or 3rd of March of 44, because I think it took us 16 or 18 days to get across. So once you're in England, how long did it take you to start preparing for the invasion of Normandy? I don't remember doing too much in England except the, uh, that uh, trip to uh, uh, ti the, 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 the exercise tiger. We didn't know anything about that it was exercise tiger at the time. We didn't learn anything that we were in it until after the war. So exercise tiger, could you, uh, could you explain what was the objective? Well, it was, it was a dress rehearsal of Normandy. We were fully uh, manned and we were fully uh, 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 per fully ready to go into the beach in Normandy. It, it, we were fully, uh, what I want to say, uh, it was... Uh, Fully dressed, okay. a fully dressed her, and uh, and what happened during the operation? Nothing, to my knowledge, and uh, we didn't see any of this uh, combat or and destruction uh, that was supposed to have happened at uh, at this at this exercise. Apparently, they must have had. Uh, different sections on the beach far enough away that we never saw any of those supposed accident that we didn't learn about until after the war. So what was supposed to have happened? Did the Germans torpedo several of the ships? They, they, I think they, to the best of my knowledge, they torpedoed uh, three or four LSTs <coughs> and a lot of people and equipment was lost. Were they troop carrying? LSTs? Pardon? Were they carrying troops at the time? Oh yes, we were fully, uh, uh, fully uh, staffed, and go ready for the invasion of Normandy. And uh, you didn't read about it till after the war. Never knew anything about it until after the war. So, uh, come June, uh, what was, what was the first cargo that you loaded for the invasion of France? We were loaded with uh, army ducks, and. Uh, what exactly is a duck? A duck is uh, is sort of an amphibious <laughs> jeep, <laughs> to my knowledge. And uh, they were the deck was the tank deck was loaded with them, and the and the t top deck was loaded with the uh, ducks. And were you uh, equipped with any other craft or uh, vehicles to go across the channel? I believe you said uh, you had six uh, LCVPs attached to the hull? Yeah, there, we had six LCVV, LCVPs that were attached, three on each port and starboard side. And what were those to be used for? And they were to uh, report uh, to somebody uh, on, the, on the beach who would direct them to go to certain ships like uh, uh, cargo ships to either take off cargo or personnel, uh, mostly personnel. But they would take a small. They could take a small uh, vehicle in. Like a jeep uh, or something. But like that. but the LC that was the job of the LCT. The LCT would uh, would t take a a tank, a small tank, on men personnel into the beach. Like a, like a Stewart, like a, a tank like that? Pardon? Like a light tank, like a Stewart, something like that? Oh, yeah, they, they took in uh, a, a tank. I, I don't know how big the tanks were, but they could, they were big enough to take one or, <coughs> they were big enough to take a tank. I don't know if they could take two or not, but uh, that was their job to really, to uh, have the, the Liberty ships, the Liberty ships could unload tanks too. And, uh, and they could drop them down on their boom and put them in into the LCTs, and uh, the LCTs could take them into the beach.
And you said you're also there are uh, AKAs, uh, attack transports with your yeah, boy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, could they do the same thing with the boom? Yeah, they could. Uh, I don't know too much about the AKA. In fact, I don't really know anything other than they 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 were a, a, some sort of attack cargo. I think I don't know the, what their what their name was other than an, an attack. I don't know whether the K stood for cargo or not. But uh, so, what day did you get to uh, the Normandy Beach? Well, we were going b back and forth on the channel. We didn't beach until you were called in to the to, to go in. And we were supposed to go in on D-Day, but because it took them so long to establish a beachhead, we were told to go in about, I don't know, two or three o'clock in the afternoon of D-2, but we were there all the while that uh, this invasion was taking place. So do you remember um, any events from the night of June 5th or June 6th? Do you recall um, the Allied aircraft flying over? Well, the, f the first night that we were anchored off uh, Normandy, uh, a, d a brand new destroyer, they said it was a Fisher class, anchored maybe 500 feet away from us. And it was the only aircraft, that, a German aircraft, that I ever saw. <coughs> it came over, and it was about dusk. And uh, all I know is that a torpedo uh, had gone down the, the stack of this uh, destroyer and broke its back. That's what we were told. And we had two uh, doctors aboard at the time. And uh, the boat, uh, our small boats went, took the doctors over, and they said it was just terrible what they saw uh, okay. of the uh, the men. Were there any the, survivors? Uh, uh, there, yeah, there were all, quite a few survivors. I don't <clears throat> I don't remember if we took any back, but uh, there were survivors, and uh, I don't know if the. Navy took care of them, or the Army took care of them, but they, they took care of them. They were taken care of, and, and, uh, and those that, that uh, managed to uh, not be injured were taken by other ships, in, including our own, to, to, just to come aboard to bring back to England. Did you witness uh, any other ships being sunk or damaged or destroyed? Well, I, when we were going into the beach on D uh, plus two, or D plus one, <coughs> I noticed that the, an LST on our port side hit a mine. And I saw it raise up a little bit and then coast all the way into uh, the beach on its just coast, that's all. And I heard that they lost about 13 men there, and I presume it would be the machine room got men. And then as we went in further, as we, further, as we approached the beach, I remember seeing an, uh, a minesweeper hit a mine. And, of course, and I always remember, I can still see it, the spray and splinters of wood going up in the air, and the f motor's still firing. I could see the flames come out. And before that spray came down, there was nothing left of that ship. It had gone down. But we, we did send some small boats in, and uh, there, uh, there were some survivors there, too. Uh, I don't know how anybody could survive that. Were there many mines along the Normandy beachhead? Were there what? Were there many mines along the Normandy beachhead? It was loaded with mines. And you, we, when, you, uh, when we were st <coughs> standing off the beach, uh, we could hear the mines going off every two or three seconds. There were so many minesweepers doing their job, cutting the minesweeps, 
the mines rather, and they'd float to the top, and then they'd shoot them. And all you heard all day long was boom, boom, boom. And that continued all the time. So they, get, they did a pretty good job of clearing the way for us because we got in and out without any trouble. So there are never any casualties on your ship? There was never any casualties on board our ship except when we were in southern France. One of the small boats that uh, was going into the beach, uh, he got hit on the side of, of his thigh with a bullet. And that's the only one casually of our ship. Was he wounded or killed? He was just wounded. And I don't know what happened to him. He probably went back to the United States. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what was the invasion of southern France like then? It was really uh, very quiet in a sense, except, <clears throat> again, we saw, as we were going towards the beach, we saw one German aircraft come over, and that threw an, an aerial tamp, uh, torpedo, and it hit the LST on our port side, and, and it, it set fire to it. And uh, that uh, ship was destroyed. It just was loaded with ammunition and everything else. And, and uh, a lot of men were killed on that. And the, the one thing that I remember about it is that each LST had two small boat officers. And the two small boat officers were in the water already unloading Liberty ships or anybody else that they were told to take people off. And the small boat, one of the small boat officers was assigned back to our ship and came back home with us uh, after we left uh, uh, Palermo uh, in the Mediterranean to come home. And uh, later he became part of our ship company. So, um, I take it you were never a prisoner of war then? Pardon? So I take it you were never a prisoner of war? No. <laughs> but uh, did you have any experiences with prisoner of war? Only the, the only thing, I didn't really have any personal experience. I didn't come in contact with them. But uh, when we went, made our first trip back to England from Normandy, we did take a few German prisoners back and they were locked up on the tank deck and uh, <clears throat> we never uh, had anything to do with them but I did uh, understand that uh, some of the enlisted men could talk German and found out that uh, they said that they didn't know why we were here because they were already bombing New York City. Of course we all got a laugh out of that but uh, that's all I know about the German uh, prisoners that we took back to England. So, um, did they follow really the stereotype of, you know, old men and children that they expected to find on the Normandy beaches? Pardon? Isn't that what they said, uh, something about how, um, like, battle planners were, were saying that, you know, on the Normandy beach was supposed to be defended by old men and children? Oh, I don't know anything about, uh, oh, about, okay. about that. I think it's just uh oh but I know that's typical of uh the opponents like in uh in uh Indochina you know uh Vietnam, th Vietnam. they they uh and even even now the the uh Islamic they 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 put uh women and children uh Right now, uh, the, uh, you know, when they're fighting over in uh, uh, Gaza, the Gaza Strip, you know, I you, they, I think they've m made mention of that. How they, they always uh, use uh, schools and 
things like that to uh, where a lot of uh, uh, pe- uh, public is uh, that cannot defend themselves and they uh, you know I read about this even today that that's what they they do that, that they uh, they try to uh, they know that the most of the democracies don't want to go into situations like that because we're told that we don't really uh, do anything but abide by the rules of war. So I take it you probably didn't see witness any civilian casualties during the war? No, didn't see any. And um, what were your experiences like in the Pacific? The Pacific... Uh, so when were you deployed to the Pacific? Yeah. <clears throat> Well, we left uh, sometime around, let's see, my, uh, 45, sometime around February, um, February or March of 45. So before the war was over in Europe? Uh, bef- before the war was over in Europe. And uh, uh, we went down to Guadalcanal, no, uh, to, uh, what's the Navy base down in, uh, Cuba. Oh, Guantanamo Bay. We went down to Guantanamo Bay, probably stayed overnight or a couple of days, and then we went through the canal. And uh, then we went up to San Diego, and we stayed there for a few days. I don't know why they sent us up to Seattle. We went there for a few days. And then we went out to uh, Hawaii. And we were there probably for a week or so. And then we went out to Anahuitoc. Uh, I can't remember just what uh, islands we went in order, but I knew that we, we stopped at Guam, and Guam was a Navy hospital base. And after that, we went to uh, Okinawa, and we arrived at Okinawa the day after uh, uh, not Eisenhower, who was uh, MacArthur? MacArthur declared it secured. Okay. <coughs> I never saw so many zeros in my life. In the air? On the in the air. air. And uh, we had only dropped anchor there for about an hour. And we were told to pull up anchor, make smoke, and get out of the harbor right away. And the zeros were coming in. You wouldn't believe it. They were after us. They never hit us. And they, <clears throat> but we, uh, later on when we went back to uh, the dock, there was an LST that they went, they dove right through the side of it because they were a kamikaze. Right. And uh, that's the only thing that I ever saw about, but I did not see that happen. We docked alongside of it, that's all I can tell you. So, did you see any other combat in the Pacific? Well, let me put it this way. Uh, we did take casualties uh, from Okinawa, and we took, it, we took them all the way back to Guam. And uh, I knew my uncle was a hospital corpsman uh, in the Navy, and he was stationed on Guam. And so I asked the skipper, since we were going to be there for a few days, if I could look him up. And I, uh, he said, okay. So I did look him up, and I found him. And uh, he was telling me that um, they had to be careful even though they were secured on the island, there were still Japanese warriors around, and they had to watch the per- perimeter of the base for them to, not to come in, because they, would, they were still desperate, and they would fight until the end. So, uh, and you know, years after, they, got, they were still fighting on different islands thinking that the war was still on. <coughs> but anyway, we only took 
we only took a, a casualties to, to Guam once. And then, to the best of my knowledge, we went down to Lady Gulf. And Lady Gulf, uh, we started to load up to go into Japan. And then uh, they dropped the bomb while we were in the Gulf. And, uh, you know, the results, it was over in a few days. So, um, what were your feelings associated with the decision to use the atomic, uh, uh, the atomic bomb in Japan? I had no ill feelings towards uh, the government for doing that. I thought it saved a lot of lives. Because if we had gone into uh, in Japan, we would have lost a lot of lives. And they would have fought differently than the Germans did. Uh, they would have fought to the end. That's the way they, they were. Because uh, I've watched uh, uh, the TV on how they, well, you know how they treated the, 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 their prisoners uh, in that march. They were merciless to, to them. And also I've seen this, uh, uh, how they, I think it was Okinawa, they killed their own women and children, made them jump off the cliffs because they didn't want them to be captured by the you know, Americans when they were losing the war. Uh, I didn't know anything about that until I'd, until I'd seen it on TV. And uh, so I'm, as far as my feeling, I was glad that it happened because it meant that I, had, I didn't have to see any more service and I would come back whole. It seems like that's um, a very common consensus. Um, well, I think we have an awful lot of fanatics <laughs> in this country that think we did the wrong thing. And I would wonder how they would think if they were in the front lines and then they heard this dropping of the bomb, if that would change any of their minds today. So did that come over the radio <coughs> almost at the day that it happened? Yes, that, that we knew we knew problem. about it pretty much right away, and uh, so we we all we all thought that well this is not going to last. They're not going to, uh, you know, have any more bombs dropped on them because they lost so many thousands of people, both personnel, uh, uh, civilians, as well as uh, their army, uh, uh, their manufacturers and things like that so they could they could have been wiped out in just a few days if we kept it up so do you remember both bomb droppings both Hiroshima and Nagasaki while you were well there? I oh we heard about it immediately mm. and because our radio was going all the time so, I mean the, the the radio on board ship uh, we we kept it. We were, we were informed of what was going on all the time. So were you in Lady the uh, the day the war ended? We, were we in Lady? Yes. Yes, we were we were in there because it it uh, it took them quite a see I don't, see that happened around August sixth uh, or something like that. I don't know what date it was, and they didn't sign the armistice until what what September ninth on the on the battleship Missouri. Yes with MacArthur, and uh, I think we were pretty lucky to have a guy like MacArthur because he didn't believe in, in vengeance to such an extent. He was pretty lenient with them, and they appreciated it, and now they're, they're one of our best uh, allies, really. That's right. Second largest world economy. Yes. Well, the, yeah, I guess they are right now, but... Uh, they're soon going to lose that. That seems to be the way the tide's going. Yeah. But um, do you recall uh, the day that the war ended? Did you, do you remember what that was like for you? Well, it, I don't remember anything other than it was over and that, that, that we, we were happy that we didn't have to go in Japan. Do you remember what you were doing? Were there, were there any celebrations? or? Well, we were... 
All I know is that, uh, no, I, I don't remember any celebration. Uh, all I know that all of us were pretty happy and that we knew that uh, we wouldn't have to go into Japan. And What kind of cargo were you loading for the invasion? We weren't loaded up yet. The only thing they were doing, they had the pontoons that were uh, being uh, tied down to each side of the ship. I think almost all LSTs brought in were getting ready for pontoons uh, to make the bridges are going in any place because. Now, uh, did you earn any medals or citations in the service? Uh, <clears throat> I earned uh, two in the in the uh, European for Normandy and southern France, and then there was another one. Uh, 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 something about the uh, participating in an invasion of France, some medal, medal, uh, uh, medal that they gave. And then there was uh, uh, also a participation in Okinawa, even though we, we didn't get in there the day after, but I guess they considered the zero <laughs> attack on us bad enough because that was worse than Normandy. <coughs> and so we got a we got a citation for that. And uh, so while you were overseas, uh, how did you stay in touch with your family, with your wife? Well, we had uh, that mail. What did they call the mail? Was it V mail? E mail? Was it V mail? V mail. Yeah, we had we wrote back and forth most every day. And uh, do you recall what the food was like in the service? Wonderful. Really? I was in charge of food. And uh, I had a good uh, commissary steward. And uh, so he wrote up the menus and I had to sign them. And I had to uh, present them to the skipper every week, and he had to sign them. And I didn't know one law in the Navy, what do you call it, Navy regulations. If you change the, if you change the Navy, if you change the menu for anything, <coughs> you were supposed to inform the skipper. And the week after D-Day in Normandy, we were back on the beach, and we were all in general quarters. <clears throat> and we had a menu on that Sunday of fresh ham, mashed potatoes, bees, uh, applesauce, apple pie, and ice cream. And since we were at general quarters, I didn't tell the skipper that we didn't make ice cream. And I didn't know anything about this rule. And so uh, we were at general quarters, and we had already eaten, and we were, I didn't tell you, we were a flagship, so we had a full captain aboard ship. He was in charge of 36 LSTs in Normandy. He was a pain in the ass. And he complained to the skipper that he didn't get any ice cream. And, <clears throat> and so, uh, I don't know why, why the skipper did this, but I was at general quarters and I was down at the stern at the three inch 50. And he piped over the f headphones that uh, Mr. Floyd report to the quarter deck immediately, on the double. So I go up there, and I'm not knowing what the trouble was. I knew he was angry. You could tell that by his voice. And there were a lot of men on the quarter deck. And he read my ass out something awful, because not telling him about didn't have ice cream on uh, that Sunday meal. And I said, Skipper, we're at general quarters. 
we make high cream by the hand crank. I'd have to take five or ten men off general quarters. You would have reamed my ass out if I, if I took t ten people off general quarters to, to crank up ice cream. <clears throat> it didn't make any difference. He was teed off at me. And so when he got all through, he sent me, well, he said, okay, go back to the gun tub. I said, the trouble with you is every time that goddamn commander, commander blows his nose, you wipe his ass. Because I wasn't going to let him get away with murder uh, telling me what I had done wrong. He could have just as well told me in private a, a small thing about not having ice cream on, uh, we, because you don't, we don't have any ice cream makers. We make it by hand. And we had to take five or ten people off general quarters to do it. <coughs> so he blew up at that, which I expected to. He said, you go to your quarters and don't you come out until you apologize. I said, Skipper, you'll never get an apology from me. And uh, so uh, I went down to my quarters. And of course, this incident went through the, uh, the ship just like that. And my commissary steward came up to me and he said, uh, she, we heard what happened. He said, you did a good job. He says, how do you want your steak tonight? I said, I don't want anything other than ship's quad, you know, mess. And uh, so we were, on the, we were in Normandy for about, I would say, five days. This, not, this didn't happen the first time we were in Normandy. This happened the second or third time. And uh, so <coughs> uh, the day before we got back to England, the skipper sent the messenger over, told, told Mr. Floyd to report to him right away. So I went over to see him. He said, are you going to apologize to me? I said, I told you, I'm not going to apologize. You're not getting an apology from me. He turned as red as the beat. He, he had two fists alongside. I thought, sure, he was going to punch me in the face. But he didn't. And I kind of ducked because I, ex I expected him to hit me because he was so na damn mad that I would not apologize to him no matter what happened. I figured if he wanted to ball me out, he could have done it in private. He didn't have to do it with a uh, ship's company and some of the staff at General Quarters at that time on the quarter deck. And so uh, I, uh, I would not apologize and I never did apologize. But uh, he said, okay, you can start standing watches, because he knew he wasn't going to get an apology from me. So the, the other officers were glad I came back, because they, they got one more officer to, in the rotation. Uh, so uh, <coughs> I remember uh, you told me a humorous story off camera about uh, there's one man on ship who the, the skipper would take guff from, right? There was one man what? Wasn't there one man on the ship that could talk back to the captain? Well, there was one man that was friendly with him. He, uh, and uh, uh, did, I, did I tell you before with the interview? Yes. Yeah, so could, 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 could oh, could you, oh uh, okay. I didn't that, know. Tell that story again. It's a good oh, story. okay. There was, <clears throat> he was, it was the engin engineering officer. It was really the only best friend that Skipper had of all the officers. And uh, when he, he, I don't know what happened. We were eating dinner or had just got through with dinner and something happened. And he said to all of us, you goddamn reservists don't know what the hell you're doing. And the engineering officer said on either his left or his right, 
tapped him on the wrist and said, Skipper, who the hell do you think is winning this goddamn war for you? With that, he got up off the ta- out of the up out from the table and walked out of the mess room. That was the end of that. <laughs> so those are a few stories that I remember. Some are good, some bad. <laughs> so, uh, did you have plenty of supplies while you were in the service? Pardon? Did you have plenty of supplies while you were in the service? Oh yes, as I said. Uh, when I was assigned to the LST, I was assigned as a ship, as a stores officer. So it was my responsibility uh, to uh, get uh, uh, requisitions from all the officers, whatever they needed when we hit a uh, base, uh, some base. <clears throat> sometimes we need noir ammunition, sometimes we need some uh, supplies for the people that wanted, well, we needed smokes and we needed uh, candy and we, uh, whatever, whatever uh, we wanted, the, diff- the various officers had to make requisitions and I would take it to the, the land-based supply and uh, get them filled and come back with a crew and take them back to the ship. And so, uh, uh, but I, I was, <clears throat> uh, the stores officer was in charge of commissary and, uh, and the, uh, the uh, yeoman. We have one yeoman. And uh, so uh, my, my duty was to get all the supplies that the other officers needed, plus whatever my commissary uh, 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 um, chief, he was a chief petty officer whatever he said he needed and so that was my job and then I, I'd get a crew of men and we'd go to shore and bring it back to ship and that, that was uh, that was it oh. and um, do you ever feel any pressure or stress like while you were overseas I never felt any pressure even though I didn't like the skipper, I, I never felt any pressure. Um, I guess I was too dumb. I didn't. I was too naive about it. Well, you were also pretty young at the time, right? Yeah, we we had a. I thought we had a pretty good bunch of officers. Now, is there anything special you did for good luck while you were overseas? Not to my knowledge. <laughs> And uh, on board the ship, uh, how did you entertain yourself, or how did the crew entertain themselves? Well, uh, we had the um, communications officer. <clears throat> uh, he liked to play chess, and nobody on board chess knew how to. Uh, nobody on board ship knew how to play chess. And so he approached me, and I said, "Well, I don't know a thing about chess." said, uh, you want to learn? I said, okay. So he taught me how to play chess. And we played chess, but I'd never win with him. He, he was good. But then I told you that the uh, small boat officer on LS-282 that got hit in the southern France came aboard. And he later became part of ship's company. And he had just learned how to play chess himself. And he... <laughs> he knew that the that I had just learned, and we played chess all the time that we weren't performing any particular duties. And to the best of my knowledge, we played 200 games, and we each won 100. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> he went out to the Pacific with us. That's why we. That's why we had so much time to to, to play chess. And um, then when the war was over in the Pacific, people were going home, and LST's people, personnel were leaving too, because they had enough to get out. And uh, he was our executive officer at that time, and he was chosen uh, to take command of another LST whose 
captain had left. So he, he left us sometime while we were in, uh, I think before, we, I never told you that we went to Shanghai. But we did go to Shanghai. We, we made three or four trips to Shanghai and uh, took Chinese soldiers to Formosa. Uh, we made, uh, and uh, <coughs> I felt sorry for those guys. They, they, no, they ate nothing but rice all the time. And when they had to take a crap, they had a crap over the side. Oh, I felt so sorry for them. They were sick too. <laughs> but anyway, <coughs> uh, after, uh, after he left the ship to become a captain on an another, he got a spot promotion as full lieutenant. And uh, after, he, uh, <coughs> well, we didn't, put, we didn't play chess anymore. And then the, the war was all over, so all I wanted to do was get home. And uh, <coughs> I didn't tell you one more experience that happened to me. After, after uh, that experience about the ice cream, it was shortly after that that I got promoted to JG. And the yeoman came up to me and he said, uh, the skipper won't sign your papers f for being a JG. He said, don't worry, Mr. Floyd. He's got to sign it or tell the Bureau of Personnel why he won't sign it. And I says, oh, if he has to tell him that I didn't have any ice cream <coughs> and what happened afterwards, I don't think he'd go too well with that. So, the day we, we were getting back into North, we came back from, 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 from uh, Palermo, uh, the day before we got into Norfolk, the yeoman came up to me and he says, Mr. Floyd, he signed your papers. And he said, you don't have to worry about your back pay because it's all due the day, the day you became promoted. So that was the end of that. It's not so bad. Did you ever take any leave while you were in the service? No, only, only what was um, when we came home. Uh, or, well, the, the, we got leave after we graduated from um, after we graduated from midshipman school, we got about a month. And uh, then when we came home from Italy or the Mediterranean, we got another month off. And after that, that's all the leave I ever had was just, uh, ju just, uh, just getting out of the service, that's all. Oh yeah, we got a month off after that. <coughs> uh, getting out of service, I got a month off. And um, while in the service, what did you think of um, your officers and fellow soldiers, like the other lieutenants on board? Uh, How would you feel about them? I thought they were all pretty nice guys, because we were all in the same boat. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we, we were there because we had to do something. And uh, I always had a question about LSTs. Uh, why don't they name them? other than a number? Well, I don't know why, but I would say there's too many of them. There was over a thousand of them. Wow. I think there was something like 1056, all in all. And uh, I'm not sure of that figure, but I know it was over a thousand. And they, I was told that they only lost 37 LSTs. So that's not too many. Three, four percent? Pardon? about between three and four percent? Yeah, not very much. And um, did you keep a diary while you were in the No, I didn't. It was against the Navy regulations to keep diary or take pictures. Wow. So I didn't have a, I didn't keep a diary. I didn't take a, I didn't have a camera, but that's not what the listed men did. They, some of them kept diaries and a lot of them had cameras. And if it wasn't for some of them, I wouldn't have some of the pictures that I have. But I, I was looking for pictures today. I should have been looking for it because I know I got a lot of them that the enlisted men had taken. 
But I did get two or three of them I got on the table to show you. Now, do you recall the day your service ended? Pardon? Do you remember uh, the day that your service ended? Do you, do you remember what that was like? First of February okay. of 1946. But I was already on leave from January 1 to February 1. And uh, so I was looking for a job because I didn't have any jobs. I wasn't working when the, uh, when the war broke out, so nobody owed me a job. And I had a hard time finding the job. Now, uh, did you ever go back to school uh, through the GI Bill? No, because I got my Bachelor of Science uh, degree in, in accounting, so I never had any uh, desire to go back to school. And uh, did you find an accounting job after the war? Did I find any what? Did you find an accounting position after the war? Uh, uh, I, I had a hard time, and so I went up to, I'm from New Haven, so I went up to, <coughs> up to Hartford and thought about the insurance companies. And I didn't know anything about Hartford, and uh, I didn't know anything about the layout. All I knew there was a lot of insurance companies up there, so I, I stopped at, uh, oh, uh, telegraph company that was right down at the Hartford uh, office, uh, train office. What do you call that? Uh, uh, they transfer money all over the... Western Union? We Western Union. So I said to the gal, do you know anything about any insurance companies, where they're located? So she said, there's two of them up on the top of the hill, this way, and one up the other way. So... Uh, she pointed me up to uh, Aetna Life, so I went there first, and uh, I finally talked to the personnel department there, and they said, we got over 900 people coming back from the service, and we don't know what we're going to do with them. So said, I'm sorry, we can't help you. But he says, why don't you go over to the National Fire? So he directed me over to there. and. Uh, got over to there and uh, talked to their personnel and they said uh, I got over 225 people coming back and I don't know what I'm going to do with them but he says we're going to start a uh, uh, I don't know what he said a life company or a casualty company in September well this is January <laughs> he says <coughs> <coughs> if, if you want to, you can sign up for that. And I said, well, I can't wait that long. So I got, I was said, the heck with this, I'm going home. So I started to walk down to the, uh, <coughs> the railroad station, and uh, I uh, passed the Hartford Fire Insurance Company. I thought, oh, well, I'll try one more. So I went in there, and I talked to the, Excuse me. I talked to the to the uh, personnel, and I don't know anything about the company, but there's three companies in there. One is the Hartford Accident Indemnity. One is the Hartford Fire Insurance Company, and uh, there's another company called the uh, the Hartford um, Livestock Company, and so. The Hartford Casualty Company is uh, on the first floor, so that's who I spoke to. He says, I got over 200 men coming back, and uh, I don't know what I'm going to do with them. He says, but I'll call Phil Brown. He's vice president and personnel manager of the Hartford Fire upstairs. And now the Hartford, I didn't know this, but I, said I didn't know anything about the companies. But the Hartford Fire Insurance Company is one of the oldest insurance companies in the country. I don't know that. And uh, so he calls up Phil Brown and he says, I got a fellow down here that has accounting background and uh, he's looking for a job. Do you want to interview him? 
I don't know why he said yes, but he said yes, and so I went up to see him. And, <clears throat> and uh, he interviewed me for a while, and then he said, uh, he's, a, he's an en engineer from graduate of Worcester Polytech. Okay. But he's, he's probably 60-some-odd uh, years old. And he's uh, involved with building an addition to the Hartford Fire Insurance Company. And he says, I got to leave you now, but I'll turn you over t to uh, the accounting uh, officer. And so uh, he turned me over to a fellow by the name of Frank Mann. And uh, so I must have talked with him for about an hour. So I thought, well, gee whiz, he must be pretty interested to talk to this long. And uh, so then he says, well, it's time to eat. So he said, uh, you'll go out and have lunch and come back, and I'll, I'll go out and have lunch and come back and see you about, I guess, 1 o'clock. Okay. So I came back and must have talked about another couple of hours. And uh, so he, he finally told me that he didn't have, although he was in charge of the accounting department, he was also also in charge of the statistical department, the data processing department, but at that time it was statistical. And he said, the, uh, the fellow that in charge of the statistical department was superintendent. And uh, around Christmas time, he had made arrangements to have all his tea taken out at the Hartford Hospital. And he says, here we are now in the midst of an annual statement. And his boss has a heart attack the day before, thanks, uh, before Christmas. He says, he's 68 years old, so I don't think you'll see him. <clears throat> so, anyway, he takes me down to the, uh, shows me around the data process, the, uh, the statistical department, and uh, when we come back, he says, uh, if you're interested in that, I'll uh, uh, I'd recommend that you, do, you go down in the statistical department. Well, it did look pretty bad at that time, you know, not having a job anyplace. So I, I said, okay. So I, I signed up for him. He said, when do you want to start working? I said, next Monday. This was Friday. <laughs> so I started working for him on the 28th of January, just a few days before my leave was up. Gen uh, February 1st and uh, so I, I worked there for almost 37 years and I became manager of the data processing department uh, before, before I left. I wanted to be an officer but I couldn't do it but uh, I suppose I ought to be satisfied. I had one more step to go but times were getting bad then and so uh, I decided to go out as a manager of data processing department. Now, did you join a veterans organization? Anytime? No, I didn't. Um, until uh, 1992, I got a call from uh, a fellow, and uh, I answered the phone and he said, Mr. Floyd, and I said, yes. He says, does the name Bob Burns mean anything to you? It did right away. But I hesitated, and because I hesitated, he says, how about LST-46? And I says, oh yeah, you were one of my gunner's mates. You were tall and you, were, you had uh, red curly hair. And he said, believe it or not, I still got my red curly hair. He says, did you ever hear of of the LST Association. I said, no. He said, would you join? And I said, well, I'd like to know, know a little bit more about it. So I said, how do you ever happen to hear about me? 
Well, he said, uh, I belong to the LST Association. And uh, Tracewitz, oh, I says, he lives down in Alabama. He was a second skipper of our ship when we were out in Pacific. And I, I said, how'd you get a hold of him? Well, he said, he belongs to the LST Association. And he says, why don't you get a hold of Mr. Floyd? He lives in Connecticut. <coughs> and I said, but you lived in New York when, you, when I left the ship. Well, he told me that he, his wife died and he remarried and, he, and he's now living in uh, oh, Westport or something down, down in uh, Connecticut. And he, and Tracewitz had told him about me being living in Connecticut. So he says, I've been looking for you for 50 years. He says, you get, when you left the ship, you gave your address of Poughkeepsie, New York. And I said, well, that's where my wife was staying, so that's where, <clears throat> that's the only address I knew. I didn't know where I'd be. I didn't have a job. He said, I called the telephone company in Poughkeepsie. I called IBM in Poughkeepsie, and they didn't know anything about you. And he says, then uh, when I knew about the uh, LST Association and got in touch with Tracy, he told me about you, and he gave me your telephone number. So here I am. So I joined it, and uh, it's, it's been a good organization. And we do get together, or have gotten together, every year. And uh, the last year I went, I think, was uh, uh, in Alabama, 2000. And I think it was 2000 or 2001. And I have no, I did go to one in Buffalo. I went to Buffalo. That was after that. And uh, the 1995 was a uh, uh, reunion was in, in Cincinnati, Ohio. And uh, there were something like 17 fellows from the LST-46 that were there. They always get a few, but not that was the biggest group we ever got by, was 17. Was it good to see them again? Pardon? Was it good to see them again? Oh, yeah. I mean, we all knew each other, and we could all talk about old times on, on an LST and how bad the skipper was and so forth. <laughs> so did these military experiences uh, influence the way you think about war or the military in general? No, I didn't bother me one way or the other. I was, you know, I, w I didn't want any part of the Navy or, or any part of the service after the war. And do you think that the service or the experiences have affected your life? Uh, the, no, they did, I don't think it affected my life. I, I mean, it didn't, I thought I had a pretty good time, so to speak, because we came out without a scratch. We had good fellowship from both the enlisted men and the officers. The only bad experience I had was with a skipper. And that didn't turn out too bad because uh, before we went out to the Pacific, he said to me, first of all, he knew that I wasn't a drinker and he wasn't, I wasn't a carouser. And he knew I didn't spend any money so he knew I had saved quite a bit of money while we were in the service. And he said, we're not supposed to have a Coke machine aboard. And he says, but I'll go in with you if you'll go in with me and put up some money and we'll buy Coke syrup before we go out to the Pacific. And we can get it through the ship service or supply departments. So I said, okay, how much you want? Well, he says, I think we should start off with 400 gallons of syrup. I said, okay, how much is it going to cost? Well, he didn't know, and I don't know remember either, but I, I could have my money anytime I wanted. Because, so I said, well, whatever you decide, okay with me. I'll, I'll go with what I got. 
So he was friendly from that point on. And we did go out to the Pacific together. But uh, he lost his engineering officer, his only real friend on LST-46. Because when we came back, the Navy Department had taken half of the ship's company and they told who was going, what officers and what men were going to go, and they were going to be the nucleus of another LST. And uh, so that uh, when he lost his engineering officer, he really lost his best buddy, because he knew we didn't have any friends as far as we were concerned. Uh, we all tolerated him, and he tolerated us. And... Uh, so anyway, when he approached me this way, I said, sure, I'll do whatever I can. He didn't approach any other officer, but he did approach me. And uh, so uh, I, don't, I don't even have any idea how much money we put in, but between the two of us, we bought 400 gallons of syrup from the ship's uh, supply department. I don't know how much it costs, but... Uh, and he said, I don't worry about uh, uh, dis uh, uh, dispersing the to Coca-Cola because in an engineering group can put a machine together and we make all the ice so we got plenty of ice and he says all we have to do is mix uh, water <coughs> uh, with the CO2 and he says we got plenty of CO2 so he said I don't worry about making a dispenser and sure enough we made it this dispenser and we had Coca-Cola uh, all, all the while we were in the Pacific. And uh, the, th the thing I said to him after a while was I said, You're, uh, you know, we're not supposed to make more than 15% 50, on ship service, what we sell to the men and anybody else. And I said, we're making so much money just charging 10 cents a glass, and it was a big glass. I said, we got to, you're supposed to, if you make more than 15%, you're supposed to turn it into the Navy. I said, I don't want to do that. I says, how about if we drop it down to a nickel? I says, we'll still make money. And I says, I'll charge shoes 10 cents, 15 cents, shirts, skippy shirts, shirts or anything. We're going to just, and candy bars. Everybody likes candy. So I said, we'll just charge a nickel for everything. And we'll still make money. And so we made so much money that, um, or, or cut down on our, our profits so that we never gave anything back to the Navy personnel. Uh, that's another thing I remember about the Navy. Well, uh, I keep thinking, seeing you look at a, at a meter, so I think you're about ready to go, or, or you already have. I think, Mr. Floyd, I think we've, uh, I think we, we've, we've reached the end of our interview here. I think we've, uh, we're hitting the, uh, the 90 minute mark. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to say on behalf of the, uh, the Veterans History Project, thank you very much for your service and uh, contributing this interview today. Oh, thank you.